Angels! Hit the pace car! What for? Because you hit every other damn thing out there, I want you to be perfect! When I'm driving, I got a guy on the radio who talks to me. It's him. He talks to me. He didn't slam you, he didn't bump you, he didn't nudge you, he rubbed you. And rubbing son is racing. Hey race fans, welcome to the Hoobazoo Radio Network and welcome to the Drafting the Circuits radio program. My name is Frank Santorowski. I'll be your host for the next hour as we go over this past weekend in racing and preview the coming week. Joining me in the studio are Mr. Gray Warren, Mr. Richard Uden, and Mr. Seth Eggert. Fellas, how are we doing tonight? Doing good. Very good, thank you. All right, so let's... Uh, Let's uh sorry, Gray, I didn't mean to cut you off there. <laughs> let's uh let's quickly knock out the headlines and then we'll get into some more in depth discussion. But uh IndyCar had not uh, one but two races this weekend. Uh one in the wet, one in the dry. The duels of Detroit uh race one ended up with Scott Dixon in the fence and Joseph Newgarden in the winner's circle, and race two ended with ended with Joseph Newgarden in the fence and Scott Dixon in the winner's circle, uh, keeping the championship battle tight with Simon Pagano <laughs> and Rossi right in the mix. Uh, meanwhile, the um, NASCAR series was at Pocono, the tricky triangle, what turn four, and it was Kyle Busch taking the win. So, Gray, Seth, let's uh, let's run down Pocono real quick. It's it's one of my favorite tracks uh, in the country, honest to God, and it's uh, it's uh, it can lead to a pretty interesting show. That it can, and uh, it was a typical Pocono race. You had split strategies, some teams opting to pit uh, before each stage end, while other teams opted to pit between the two stages. Kyle Busch was one of the ones opting to do it before the stage end. And then you had Kyle Larson, who won the two stages, pitting between the two stages. So it was an interesting uh, split between the two. You didn't have... Many, it was maybe eight or nine teams total, where in the past it's been almost half the field, if not more. So it honestly kind of came down to the final caution because you really could not pass very well. But again, that's a typical Pocono race. And as a result, those who stayed out ended up finishing up front. The only person who didn't stay out that finished in the top eight was Joey Logano. And he restarted 11th. Gray, uh, what, what thoughts do you have on this Pocono race? Well, just uh, kind of kind of follow suit. I mean, it's it's coming in kind of this season's kind of falling into the to the Joe Gibbs Penske uh, show. It seems seems as though um, you know we've we've got off a little stretch there of uh, Martin Truex uh, getting his wins and and getting three three wins. Uh, in relatively quick order, and now Kyle Busch goes for his fourth win. You've already sitting with Denny Hamlin with with two wins uh, this year already, and the rest of them pretty much. Uh, you know, you, you got uh, Penske uh, with the rest, it seems. And uh, I think I think uh, Keselowski's got three as well. Yeah, Keselowski's yeah. got three, and, and and you know it just seems to be that uh, those two teams right there have just <laughs> have just. Uh, Risen above the rest of the uh, rest of the competition. And, yeah. So, uh, you know, so what's what's going on with Stuart Haas? It's it's odd that we're this deep into the season and we haven't seen a couple of Kevin Harvick wins and we haven't well, seen uh, Amarola you know, or uh, Boyer and, and all those guys had uh, wins by this point in the season last year. And they've run well. Don't, you know they've run well. Harvick had uh, Harvick had pretty much a sure win at Kansas uh, and he was denied that and he's run well. Uh, He's he's had he's had run well. I think just that you know they've had a few little uh, miscues that have cost them uh, some wins, and I, I don't I think they'll uh, they'll rebound from that as we go into this summer stretch. And I think we'll see Harvick uh, 
uh, get some wins. Boyer's been strong at a few tracks, and Amarola probably uh, has run well enough uh, to win as well. Uh, they just got to be able to close the close the deal. But, and if uh, I if I can yeah. add to that, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you also had at the beginning of the season Kurt Busch leave and go to Ganassi and. In recent years, Kurt Busch has basically gone and improved whatever organization he's gone to. I'm not saying that Stuart Haas Racing fell behind when Kurt left, but at the same time, they didn't have that veteran voice uh, where now Daniel Suarez has taken Kurt's place. Nothing uh, wrong with Suarez at all. I'm just saying, could that also be a small factor overall? That's a good point, Seth, yeah. You know, I, I kind of, I kind of feel like Harvick right now is like a sleeping giant. You know, you're gonna, he's gonna get that monkey off his back of not getting a win this year, and then he's gonna rip off four or five in a row. Yeah. Maybe not in a row, but yeah, that's, <laughs> they, that's, that's kind of how I view uh, Harvick. You can never count the guy out. They could, and another thing as well, the last Stuart Haas win was Texas last year, and that was in the playoffs. Kevin Harvick was penalized because the team had essentially messed with the spoiler and didn't have the NASCAR spoiler that NASCAR gives out to the teams. Uh, So whether or not that could also be a factor, probably not as likely. No. But it is something interesting as well that the last win uh, he had this season would have been a disqualification. Oh, well, we'll just have to see what the next several weeks hold for um for for Harvick and the rest of uh. I mean, I was Stuart Haas I there, heard yeah. from from a contact there that basically, to a certain extent, along with what Seth's saying, they they saw the new rules package for for 2019, and I think they went a little bit conservative from what they were saying, and they maybe didn't push the envelope quite as aggressively as they had in the past, and. Uh, other teams, they expected other teams to follow suit, uh, and maybe the, the consensus and the thought process within uh, SHR is that uh, the you know the other teams have pushed it as hard and are, are still in a strong position. So maybe they, you know, maybe there's a bit of truth in what you say there, and that they they sort of um, overestimated the um, you know how much they could back off. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting, interesting to ponder. Yeah, but again, like I say, you're not going to keep that guy out of victory lane all year long. So, but uh, watch. Well, of course, we've kept Jimmy Johnson out of victory lane for how many years? So, so yeah. Seth, Seth, did we have um, Xfinity race? I know, yeah, I know, so I know there was the, an Ar- there was an ARCA the, race. I know that because I watched a little bit of the ARCA race. The Xfinity series was in action at Pocono, and where the Cup series was a typical Pocono race, the Xfinity series was anything but that. Uh, all three Joe Gibbs cars had trouble at one point or another. The first caution, Brandon Jones' car uh, just snapped around and backed into the wall. Pro- just prior to the end of stage one, Christopher Bell spun around and somehow kept it off the wall. Uh, Cole Custer dominated the race. It came down to the last corner of the last lap in the overtime. Tyler Reddick had finally gotten the lead from Cole Custer, overdrove turn three. Custer snuck back by him and beat him to the line. And I don't remember the last time the Xfinity Series or any Pocono race, for that matter, in NASCAR that came down to the last lap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I, I can't, yeah, it's usually somebody's pulled out a big lead by the end. Yeah, so, I mean, good stuff for the fans there watching, you know. I'm, I'm, and and do you, do you get a chance to see the ARCA race at all, Seth? Or? Uh, I did get to see the ARCA race. Uh, the ARCA Series is struggling right now. I'll say that. Unfortunately, the ARCA race, there were, I want to say there were 18 cars total in the race. Uh, it was one second race in a row, won by Ty Majeski, uh, the same Ty Majeski who what, drove for Roush last year in the program 60 and tore up several cars. Uh, but, it seems like he's turned it around. He, Like I said, he, this is his second win in a row. He also won at uh, Charlotte uh, a couple weeks ago. There were only 18 cars. There are only 18 cars for the ARCA race at Michigan this weekend. And NASCAR home tracks, when it comes to ARCA and K&N, 
unfortunately are struggling right now. Uh, the Canaan race at Thompson Speedway, which is their throwback race, was recently canceled for various reasons. Now, 18 cars are in the Formula 1 season a few years ago. That was a good turnout. Yeah, yeah. Now, now Gray, 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 I want to pose this question to you regarding the ARCA series, because NASCAR owns the ARCA series now. They've assimilated them. Do, do you feel like there may be, because you've got, like you said, the K&N series is canceling races. The ARCA series is struggling um, to, to fill the fields. Um, Xfinity is failing to fill the stands. Do, do you see that somehow we're going to merge some of these junior series? Because we, we have, a, a with ARCA coming on board with NASCAR, there are an awful lot of, of junior series of very similar cars. Uh, could we see yeah. uh, some sort of a merger uh, to see if there's some strength in numbers? What do you feel? We, we could. We uh, could there see. is one plan. Yep. Yeah. Well, go 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 that go with your plan there. Tell, tell us about the plan there, and then I'll then I'll elaborate on what what my thinking uh, on it. Uh, well, no, NASCAR has actually announced this. There is a plan. Uh, you will have essentially three separate series, East and West, eight races, ARCA with twelve, but they're also going to have a combined series called the Stock Car Invitational. And that is essentially a championship within a championship, and it will allow for teams to go from one series to the other. Uh, it'll, one of the races I know will be Pocono because it's already on the schedule, and they've already announced it's going to be the Friday of the doubleheader weekend next year. Okay, Otherwise, so really quick, have... so, so just to clarify, the, the Invitational will encompass – the, the 16 races, the 8 East and 8 West, and the ARCA races? So that, or, or, is, this, is, or is this invitational more races? I, they haven't announced all the details as of yet. Okay. Uh, My understanding it will be four from East, four from West, and somewhere around uh, 10 from ARCA. Okay, so they're all the, basically the same races, but there's going to be some races that are both like a double double yes. dip double dip yes. you get you get points for two different championships if you're yes. running okay all right that that's actually not a bad plan now gray you want to jump in yeah and one of the things that concerns me about uh particularly about arca is and i go i, I go back to the old asa short track series that guys like trickle came from rusty wallace mark martin a lot of the Alan Kowicki, a lot of those guys. That was an immensely popular series in the Midwest. Uh, strong, uh, great crowds, uh, and sent a, and a great the uh, well, I don't, don't want to call it a feeder feeder series, but a lot of the guys that ended uh, in, in that series ended up in Cup. Just, just terrific races. Um, the downfall of that series was going to spec cars, spec engines. And once they did that, that series kind of fell off the map. Matt, oh, another guy, Matt Kenseth, came from that came from that series as well. So you, you all these names that I've just mentioned, look look what they did in Cup. I mean, it's a, a veritable who's who that came from ASA. Uh, as they changed ASA and went to more of a spec series with spec engines and things like that. And I think the series uh, lost some of its identity. The cars were all the same. Had you know, just went to fiberglass bodies and that kind of thing. And you just you you did you really wasn't seeing a lot of difference back in the heyday of the uh, ASA. You had different chassis and and different engines uh, that were prevalent uh, in that series. And they're doing the same thing with ARCA. And I know that you know it's a, a lot of times people look at it as a cost cutting measure because. Things are a whole lot more expensive than they were back in those days, but I think a lot of it the, it it loses its uh, imagination. The, the series loses its imagination for the fans and become in a spec series. I'm somewhat concerned about this going uh, in the truck series too, where they're going with a uh, with the spec engines to a degree, and and I'm worried that uh, NASCAR with this new Gen Seven car is going to go down this same road a little bit. Um, that's one of the things I think to, to me that is hurting ARCA. Uh, it, it's, it's, 
there's no variety in it anymore. Everything's everything's basically the same. To be fair, though, uh, Arca started down this ro- road going to the composite bodies in the spec engine back around 2010 yeah. is when yeah. they uh, introduced the spec engine. Mm-hmm. Right. And they still had the fields. It wasn't until this year when originally they said that they weren't going to allow any of the steel bodies. However, they re- reneged on that. Mm-hmm. But uh, it wasn't until this year that they had issues filling fields mm-hmm. printed they there's been but, races but in the past few years where it's, there have been fewer cars yeah. but the bulk were about 30 to 36 cars per field yeah i think it's a culmination and it's and it's a building thing asa didn't lose didn't lose its share overnight either i think it was a gradual decline people just got just got tired of it trying to compare it to the days of old and two um, you know, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, Arca was always a place for old cup cars to end up. Um, and, and, and that's changed a little bit to a degree as, as well too. So I, I don't know, maybe it's economics. Um, that's well, really, that's really the root problem of, of it all. I, well, you know, but let's look at a couple of teams that folded recently. You had MDM Motorsports, which won the championship in Arca last year. Uh, they're the champion, Sheldon Creed, moved to the Truck Series. Mm-hmm. Uh, Anthony Alfredo moved to the Truck Series. Uh, Chase Purdy no longer had sponsorship and left the team. Uh, Zane Smith moved to Junior Motorsports and the Xfinity Series. And the co-owner of the team, uh, Lauren Rainier, went and co-created uh, the Driver's Edge Development Program with Dale Jr. and Mike Beam. So... All of the financial backers of the team left within the, the course of two months. That team fielded five cars in ARCA. So without any financial banking, yeah. the team uh, closed up shop with, with, I think, maybe a month before the season. Yeah, I remember when it happened. But, you know, and I tell you another thing, too, with a lot of these things, you know, if, if they try to – run this thing as a business, you've got to look at what your what your financial return is going to be in, in a series like ARCA. You know, e- even the truck series and, and the X, in the Xfinity series, you're 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 somewhat limited on what your you you're very vastly limited in what your return is going to be uh, if you're trying to run a business. You essentially if you don't have the sponsorship you're not going to be around long because basically it's just going to be a break, a, a, a break even thing. It's that for, for the owners. Um, and on top of that, you also have a couple of owners that were not the best people. Let's put it that way. Uh, Roger Carter, who is a former ARCA owner, his team went under two years ago. Uh, he just settled a case with the government. He's going to serve, I think, three out of 15 years that yeah. he was originally given. And the government gets his private plane, his hangar, and the rest of his ARCA cars. Yeah, a lot of – lot. And there's some unscrupulous business people involved, but there, but, but that's in all forms. That can be in, in, in any, all levels in motorsports that we've seen over the, over the years, too. These guys get a little money and decide they want to – want to play with some of that income and uh, where, wherever it comes from. But, uh, you know, sometimes sometimes auto racing is a good way to launder, launder, money. Mo- launder money to you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've, we've seen it, it dates back as long as I can remember. Yeah. Golly, I remember yeah. da- David Essex or David theme from Essex came into Formula One as one of the, the you know, Sponsors are going to save save Lotus, save the day, and uh, yeah, next thing you know, the guy's in prison, <laughs> and, and the Essex logo was no longer on the IndyCar. And of course, you remember the uh, the whole thing in IMSA with the guys that were smuggling drugs to fi- finance their race yeah. teams. So yeah, it's it's uh, there's some unscrupulous and folks in there. Going yep. going back to uh, the Junior Series that were in action. Sorry to cut you off there, Frank. Uh, we also had. And I just want to touch on them real quick. The Pinty Series and the East Series in action. Uh, the East Series, Chase Cabry, who's in the Driver Diversity Program, earned his first victory. 
Uh, in the Pinty series up in Canada, Andrew Ranger went back to victory lane with Dodge for the first time in uh, several years. And Julia Landauer became the first woman to lead a lap in the Pinty series. Good for her. Good for her. Yeah. So the, the Pinty series has seemed to come on uh, really nicely in the last several years. They've got They've got a really good schedule. Un- unfortunately, they- this year, uh, they are now uh, airing all their races on fans choice. OK, uh, so, so I'm wrong. Uh, well, no, <laughs> you're right. You're right. I, I, just saying, mean, uh, I just mean as, as a race series, I, I think. As, as a race series, but they made one mistake this year. All their races are on fans' choice, but fans' choice is not available in Canada. Uh, there's a whole lot of Canadian people upset about motor racing coverage for, for a lot of different series. Um, IndyCar Indy, Indy, Indy is one of them. It, uh, there, there are a lot of Canadians pissed with IndyCar for the – whatever tier they have to pay for to see IndyCar races. So, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty poor decision. I think the are, – are the Pinty's races still on, on MAV-TV in the uh, States? They're or are they, NBC they are, Sports, uh, 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 the tape uh, delayed. On, on NBC or CBS? NBC Sports. NBCSN, okay, yeah. Okay. CBSSN shows a good amount of uh, racing as well. I think they generally – they show a lot of um, – they show the IMSA and whatnot so but but in general i mean you know from i mean pinty series has come a long way from when it was called cast car exactly yep yep i i just i just think it's a good series it's catching on well up north of us now uh ross chastain in the xfinity series is no longer an xfinity series driver he's uh changed his declaration to the truck series so now, maybe you or or Gray can explain this to me. What happens to the points he's earned leading up to now? I mean, does he sets to zero? So he's mid season, starting off with zero points. Well, in the truck series, he hasn't been earning points because he had chosen to earn points in the Xfinity series. Correct, correct. So, he's, so, but he, he has he has run some truck races, right? He's run all the truck races so, so far. So, so, but, but, so those races, those finishes he had, they're just gone. Well, the finishes are still there. He just didn't earn any points. That's that's what I'm asking. Yeah, if you, if you switch, do you get those points back for the no. truck races you ran? Okay. No. Yeah, that that will. He's keep, finished in keep, the top. Keep a guy from switching his his mind for exactly because he's he, doing better better one than the other. Exactly, yeah. he's finished in the top ten in every race. He's the only driver to do so. He won at Kansas. That does not count for the playoffs. He has to win again and get in the top twenty in driver points. Which right now his teammate Angela Rook is twentieth in points with just ninety one points. So it's not it. It is an uphill battle, but it's not a huge one. If he doesn't win, though, he has to get to the top eight in points, which that's 253 points away. With how many races left on the calendar? Eight before the playoffs. Wow, are we that deep into the season? Wow. There's Time. been eight truck races. They're halfway to their playoffs. Wow. Wow. So, so. Yeah, he's got. He's got. He needs to win a race for sure. He has to which, win, which which he has a capability to because he's been yeah. running well. And he he got the first one for Nice Motorsports at Kansas. Uh, he's finishing in the top ten. The only driver to do so, like I said, uh, someone put the points together. If he was running for points in the truck series, he would be second in points, one point behind uh, points leader Grant Enfinger. Okay, so so what's going on that has caused him to uh, make this decision? Is 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 Infinity is he not performing well in, in well, Xfinity? Well, he was thirteenth in points. Or... He was thirteenth in points in Xfinity, twenty five points behind the cutoff for the playoffs. Uh, unfortunately, from what it sounds like, he did, wasn't going to have sponsorship to be able to run the full season in Xfinity. So he's going to uh, commit to the races he, that he already has sponsorship in place and any that his teams, Johnny Davis Motorsports or College Racing, uh, come up with. However, from my understanding, it's more uh, 
unfortunately a combination of performance and a lack of sponsorship. Uh, Johnny Davis Motorsports last year, one of the reasons of why they ran so well, they were aligned with Chip Ganassi Racing's Xfinity Series team. The same one that closed because of the DC Solar fiasco. Before we transition to uh, making picks and whatnot, I do want to mention there's this um, there's this story that's going around on Twitter now. We've got Eddie Gossage is involved. Uh, Jay Douglas Bowles, the president of Indianapolis Motor Speedway, is involved. Um, this has to do with the uh, NASCAR and the, the them acquiring the, the ISC tracks and the possibility of uh, Indy, Indy cars and NASCAR sharing a weekend sometime as soon as maybe 2021 or 2022. Uh, do, do you think this this do you think this story has legs? Or are we, are we just idle does. talk? I believe it does because his first popped up last year uh, in which there was talk in uh, in the garage that NASCAR was entertaining the idea of trying to do a doubleheader with IndyCar at Chicagoland Speedway, which is an IC track. Uh, of course, Eddie Gossage at Texas Motor Speedway, that's an SMI track, and you'd rather have it there. And then you also have uh, Indy, which is... The, owned by, if I remember correctly, the Holman George family uh, would like to have it there. And uh, from what I've read, India has suggested a triple header weekend: IMSA, NASCAR, and IndyCar. Yeah, I know that, that would that would be something else, wouldn't it? I exactly. And I know Marcus Smith here at Charlotte Moore Speedway has proposed a double header: IMSA and NASCAR at the Roval. So there's been a lot of talk between different members of the more sports world in North America about trying to do a double or even a triple header and what kind of double or triple header. And some of this, believe it or not, is not coming directly from uh, the sanctioning bodies, but it's being proposed by uh, NBC Sports. Right, and some of the track owners as well. Eddie Gossage yeah. was the first one to jump in there and say, oh, you need to have that at my place. And then and Jay Doug said, oh, we could have it at my place. To be fair, but, uh, Marcus Smith was the first to say it last year. Okay, yeah, but but either way, I, I think that it's kind of neat. And, uh, Gray, you've been around a while, and Richard, you've been sports, you know, racing for a long time, that instead of this us-against-them mentality, we can see how we can work together since – Everybody's struggling a bit with attendance and, and viewership and whatnot. It's and that's you know th- that's not a secret. We don't need to be us against them. But uh, Gray, realistic, realistically, do you see this actually happening? Well, yeah, I, I think down the road there you're going to have to see something because basically it's as it's, it cut boils back down to economics. Like we've been talking about some of these other series hurting. You're going to have to give to get the to boost the attendance and, and, and give these series a shot in the arm, you're going to have to get fans in the, through the turnstiles. And to do that, you're going to have to give them more bang for their buck. And by combining some of these shows, uh, you, that's essentially what you're going to do. You're going to give these, uh, give the race fans, uh, you know, more value for the dollar. So we'll, we'll see what, what will happen. I think we'll see more and more of this, uh, you know, going, down the road, and particularly with talk of uh, schedule revamps that we're going to see possibly uh, next year. People are looking at some, you know, I think this is going to be a trend we're going to see develop. Uh, you know, they're talking, uh, like I said, it's just talk where some racetracks could lose a show. Well, you know, the, these are big behemoth facilities that have to have events to generate revenue to keep to 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 stay open and if you're talking about uh you know taking events you've got to have to make up that revenue somewhere else so uh yeah i'm sure we're going to see a lot of new and and innovative ideas come forth and and maybe and some of them will probably come to fruition yeah i think it's very exciting i mean there there are a couple of, of places i can think of that would do a really nice job of doing that and Watkins Glen comes to mind. Um, Watkins Glen has struggled to find a date for the Indy cars, but if they if they were there when the NASCAR guys were there, and it's already you know a nice sellout sellout mm-hmm. event for them, it's it you know Indy cars on Saturday, NASCAR on Sunday. I believe that's a win win. 
They use different layouts, though, don't they? That's the one thing I was well, going to yeah. say. Would yeah, that, but the whole, the whole layout entice... is there. What right. I was going to oh, say sure. is, yeah. would that entice NASCAR be enough of a, uh idea that NASCAR may switch from the short course to the boot course. It, it, they, if you look at Sonoma, ta- they're running the carousel for the first time in, I think, two decades. Yeah, yeah, well, there, cool. there are guys in NASCAR who would like to run the boot section. But even yeah. if, you, if you think about it, I went to a race in Watkins Glen uh, in 1979, right? And that was the first time the kart series was there. Now, the kart guys were using the short course – but the um, the Trans Am series was the support, and they were using the long course. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that the people could use the same, the two different layouts on the same weekend. But I, I do wonder that if you wanted to just, you know, to just to, to save face with lap times, if NASCAR used the shorter layout, they'd have a shorter lap. But I, I think it's no secret that Indy cars are going to have a little more speed than the tin tops. So, But I think that would be a neat place to do, although that's not been in the discussion. And the other thing is you need to have a facility with enough garages and transporter space to hold the both series plus any other support series. Yeah, and and right. Indy, Indianapolis, well, IndyCar, Indianapolis IndyCar can run out of a tent, can't it, pretty so, much? Stop it. Well, no, they're no, serious. IMSA can. IMSA can. IMSA can. But uh, there are the, garages it, at Detroit, is there? I saw, I saw, you know, the Andretti <laughs> had their uh, hall with the tent up on the side, and they had the setup scales and everything under the tent. It's not no, a bad I mean, thing. It's not a, yeah, yeah, it, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, an, yeah. it's an outdoor paddock. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah. But, but you're talking, so, I mean, but there are some tracks that have plenty of, like, Texas has plenty of garage spaces. Um, in, in, Indianapolis, Charlotte, Kentucky has a ton of garages. Kentucky hosts yeah. all three NASCAR series mm-hmm. the same weekend, Ch- and they've Chicago got Chicago land since Chicago. Was, yeah, one yeah. That yeah so started the conversation last year. Sure, but uh, those those are a lot of tracks that could that could pull this off, and I think it's exciting. So, but but go go ahead. Uh, another one that I've also heard talked about was uh, Daytona, and the idea behind that was. Obviously, it would be the road course layout because IndyCar won't touch the oval layout, and I completely understand the reason for that. But uh, they, they tested they tested the oval in um. They, they tested the, the road course, not the oval. Yeah, they a couple guys took laps on the oval. The point that I'm trying to make is uh, the, the talk there is maybe doing that the weekend of the clash uh, in February in which you would have essentially that uh, on the uh, Friday beforehand under the lights somehow, and then the ARCA race on Saturday and the Clash on Sunday. Whether or not that's an option, I don't know. I'll tell you what. It's an interesting idea. It's all very exciting, and if it comes to fruition in 2021 or 2022, I'm going to be the first person to buy some tickets for it, wherever it is, and just to go check out the doubleheader weekend. I, I where, wherever it is, I'm going to go, unless it's on the West Coast because that's a little far. So, but anyway, so let's let's make some let's make some picks for Michigan because uh, we we want to talk about the uh, IndyCar races in, in Detroit at the uh, tent campground that Richard was just talking about. So <laughs> so 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 Gray Gray, who do you like for Michigan? I'm going to say, based on his success from recently, in, 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 in not so recent, distant past, <laughs> but uh, Kyle Larson, he's been uh, showing oh. some strength lately, and uh, I'm going to say he, he returns to uh, return Chevrolet to the to victory lane. Yeah, right. You've got forty cars to pick from. You just stole. <laughs> you just stole everybody. You stole everybody's pick. So, so Richard. Uh, so you get the leftovers. So, yeah. so Kyle Larson's brother. I don't know. Um, so Fred Larson. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, oh boy. Um, oh gee. Kurt Busch. Kurt Busch. Good one. Yeah. Good one. Yep. Seth. Ah. <sighs> This is a, actually a tough one this weekend. Um, you know what? I'm going to go with a first-time winner, William Byron. Yeah, Byron, Byron's been pretty good lately. Pretty good lately. I'm going to go with the hometown boy and say Brad Keselowski. And uh, so that'll that'll be next Sunday. But uh, let's talk about IndyCar. IndyCar, we had not one but two races. 
Um, race one was delayed. Lightning, uh, thunderstorms, rain, everything you could imagine. They finally got the race underway, decided to do a timed race, a 75-minute timed race, which uh, really shortened it down from the uh, the usual two-hour timed race um, when they only had 20 minutes left in the television window to keep it on NBC because they moved it to CNBC, so I don't know why they just didn't go ahead with the whole two hours. Uh, I guess people didn't want to miss out on the episode of uh, Un- Undercover Boss that was a repeat from 2012. Uh, that they would have had to bump to put it on, but uh, that's another another story for another day. But uh, a really interesting set of circumstances. We saw Scott Dixon wreck on his own for the first time in a couple of years. I mean, he's been in a couple of wrecks, lady, but this is the first time he's wrecked on his own in like over two and a half years, and he, you know, certainly owned up to it. But uh, you know, he was gunning to uh, make up some ground in the championship and. Fell pretty far back as Joseph Newgarden got up there and uh, took the win. But the, you know, the story of the day on race one uh, was the uh, the guys that went to slicks early when the track started to dry. Uh, one of them being Marco Andretti, and if you watch the in-car camera on the replay, he drove like a madman in the rain on the slicks, kept it off the wall, did a brilliant job, and then. The, the yellow came out for sure, you know, as is to be expected. You know, uh, when we're running in the rain there, somebody's going to get a little crossed up. Uh, so he should have cycled up near the front of the field or even into the lead. But then IndyCar, for whatever reason, opened up the pits a lot quicker than they usually do. Usually, you know, the rule in IndyCar is, uh, you know, you make that stop, and if, if, you, if you didn't stop, you're screwed. Uh, because they're going to let the field pack up, and then you can then you can stop. Instead, the guy who pitted first, who should have been the benefactor, was the guy that got screwed. Now, IndyCar's explanation was, and I have it right here. I'm going to read it word for word. Um, IndyCar's explanation for coming out with the yellow rather quickly was, race control was reviewing data and closing rates based off the information the packet was developing. The goal was to get the pits open as quickly as possible for the competitors and fans, but given the circumstances that included cars on different tires and a cold track, it it did not occur as exponentially as was envisioned. In other words, the cars didn't pack up as quick as they thought they would, and poor Marco got shuffled back to 20th place after a brilliant drive in the rain. So, um, Richard, you got to watch a little bit of this. Uh, What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think Mark has, um, you know, t- taken uh, his fair share of criticism over the last few years. Um, some of it probably justified, some of it not. But you can say what you like. He drove pretty damn impressively this last weekend uh, uh, up there in Detroit on those uh, slick tyres on that pretty slippery track. It was, uh, it was pretty hairy watching the onboard for a couple of laps there. And you know, he, he, he made the brave decision and, you know, the guy, he got screwed. You know, there's no two ways about it. I mean, that's, uh, IndyCar really did him over. And I think there's, I think there's three or four of the guys wasn't, that came out onto the uh, slick tyres before that caution came out. Yeah, a couple, and, uh, yeah, couple, they, couple guys, they, they were all furious, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it, it's so frustrating because we, we talk about this time and time again, how, you know, you... you uh, and I know it's not the case every time, but you look at the majority of Indi- of sorry Formula One races, and when things like this happen, they tend to be pretty consistent ninety to ninety percent of the time. They're pretty consistent with how the rules are implemented and how they're implied, uh, how they're applied, and you know teams know what's going on under a certain set of circumstances. Whereas you struggle to say the same with IndyCar. I mean, the rule book seems to be changing week by week on what happens in a certain set of circumstances. And it's just a little bit like, well, OK, we'll do this. Yeah, let's try that. Uh, you know, it, there's not that consistency, which yeah, the teams is, is, and this, the strategy this, guys... This is blocking, oh. but this is not blocking. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's so much open to interpretation. And it's, it, you know, it shouldn't be. And it's just, it's so frustrating for the fan because... They don't know what's going on. You know, most fans will sit there and go, oh, Marco did great. You know, (coughs) excuse me, he deserved to be rewarded for it. 
And he didn't get rewarded. He got screwed. So, um, yeah, they, they really do need to just get the ducks in a row and and just not make it look like amateur hour. Because it's yeah, yeah. so much better than that. You know, I mean, NASCAR do it half the time to manipulate the races, whereas IndyCar tries to... <laughs> tries to pitch themselves a little bit higher than that. And, uh, and they yeah, still they, end up, yeah, so. I mean, because it's, uh, you know, it's pretty standard in this day and age. And, and, and the IndyCar drivers get frustrated that they wait to close the pits. You know, because if, yeah. did, if you didn't pit, you know, those guys that pitted are, are going to be ahead of you. You know, the, you yep. know you have the whole field behind you. So this has been, we've seen how many people lead a, lead a race, stretch it for a few extra laps, and then their competitors <laughs> And then the yellow comes out, and then they get mired in the back of the field, right? Yeah. And in this case, they said, well, let's just go ahead and eh, the cars are sort of packed up. I guess they open the pits. I, I mean, know, it's it just, was, yeah, it's it was. And then they try <laughs> to talk their way out of it, say it didn't happen as expeditiously as possible. So, But there was, so. there's one thing I did want to sort of to mention about the race last weekend. Right, um, right. How impressed I was with the standard of the driving in the wet. You know, um, you look at the Sunday race when it was dry, they were all over the place, driving and banging into each other and spinning. I mean, what you lose, like, there's a five or six car mess at the start of the race there. And, uh, you know, some big names got taken out. And then you look at, you know, the, the, the rain, the, the race in the rain and everybody was pretty well behaved. I was, uh, you know, credit where credit's due to those guys. They uh, they did a really good job. Yeah, there was some really, really nice driving on Saturday's race. Now, to your point, Sunday's race was, you know, pretty hard on the mechanics who've got to get cars ready for Texas on Saturday night. <laughs> you know, on a, uh, on a, uh, they're, they're, they're how many weeks on right now? So yeah, because we saw, golly, uh, Newgarden, Newgarden trying to take it three wide with uh, Borde and Hinchcliffe and take. Uh, you know, took uh, took Hinch out. Uh, Rossi got away. It wasn't yeah. Bourdais, but it was Rossi. Yeah, we saw Bourdais run over um, Spencer Piggott. Yeah, he didn't realize yeah. he was pitting. He, he, yeah. he ran over Piggott through the middle of him. J- j- jumped the car in the air. Still finished. Block. Still finished ninth. Still yeah. finished ninth. You know what I mean? So, yeah. uh, surprised the president, president called Piggott for a block. Right, I'm surprised you know. they didn't call Bourdais for avoidable contact. Is the other, yeah. the other, yeah, exactly. you know, yeah. 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 So, but um, at the end of the day, it was uh, Scott Dixon who just uh, he took his time, was patient, and ended up with the win there. Salvaged some points for this for this week. He's still, I believe, third or fourth in points. Um, uh, you know, Sato, Sato's right up there in points. Sato had a good weekend on yeah. uh, Saturday, finished in the top three. Marcus, he backed up a good strong indie, didn't they? Yes, yes. Marcus Erickson took his first podium yep. of the year, finished uh, finished second, second, second in, in race two, and that and, and that's a team that can use some good mojo for sure. You know, after yeah. after Hinch, uh, you know, having to do the the uh, last row shootout at Indy, and Erickson is. Learning curve been a little steeper than he thought, and they just have some struggles here and there for them to come out of uh, come out of Detroit race two with uh, with a second place for Erickson. Man, that's some good stuff. And then uh, Will Power third place on Sunday after a real tough uh, couple of weeks for those guys. Um, good stuff. So, uh, but we're on, we're on to Texas. And um, Richard, you want to talk about Alonzo? Uh, yes. Okay, so, so we can talk about, about Alonzo because he's still managed to, despite the mi- missing the Indy 500, have six to seven articles a day written about yes. him. So, it's um, just impressive, isn't that? I mean, I, you know, I, I, Britney Spears doesn't keep her name in the news this much. I'm I mean, telling the president you. Will be, the president will be pretty impressed, wouldn't they, with that sort of uh, publicity? <laughs> but, um, yeah. You know, so, yeah, let, around, yeah, let's talk about Alonzo. You go he, ahead. He turned around and said, uh, you know, a, a, a 500 shot is on the cards for next year, but he's not going to do a full season. Uh, he doesn't see the benefit of doing that as he'd have a lot of tracks to learn and all this sort of stuff. Well, maybe that's half the problem and why they were struggling at Indy. And I know Indy's the first oval of the season, he was right in that, but there's the, you know, we, again, we talked about it on the show plenty of times. It's the rhythm and the... Um, Becoming used to competing and being up at the front 
excuse me, up at the front and being, you know, mixing it week in, week out, going through, prepping the car, getting the car set up, making changes to the car, all these sort of things. Yes, and, learn, uh, learning learning who your competitors are. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, learn, um, learning who, who you can trust and who you can't. Yeah. Be, yeah. Becoming a part of the series, it, it makes it that much easier. It's almost – I, I, I don't. I hate using this word for Alonso because I think he's just a phenomenal talent and one of the a generational standard of driver. But there's almost a hint of arrogance there in those comments of you know, oh well, you know, we don't need to, you know, I don't need to put all this effort in to, to you know, I, I should be able to win Indy without, you know, putting the effort in basically. Yeah, and I believe in another article I read, he said his Indy next year bid will be with whoever offers him the most competitive ride, which if you read in between the lines there, it, it almost sounds like the relationship between McLaren and Alonso yeah, may, not may, McLaren, may, <laughs> may be coming to a close. Yeah. But, but you know, you know, Alon, Alon, Alonso is uh, going to bring some sponsors to the team. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. My, Michael Andretti will jump all over that. Yeah. Uh, so, so will, so would uh, Ed, Ed Carpenter or, or maybe yeah. even, maybe even a Roger, Roger Penske. Penske would, yeah. Roger Penske, and, I don't you know. know you yeah. look at some of the comments by uh, Zach Brown. You know, he said, oh, you know, McLaren will be racing long after Fernando retires, and it was here long before he started racing, you know, long before he's born. So there maybe is a little bit of trouble in paradise with that relationship there, possibly. I, I, I don't know. But, um, yeah, and McLaren, yeah, McLaren also ruled out a full season in 2020 but didn't rule out the Indy 500 so they may be giving it another shot so we'll just have to see how all that goes so but I mean it's like you know you've done it you know they can't do it themselves or do it with a you know I mean I mean, this is no disrespect to Carlin you know if they're going to do it they need to do it with somebody that is probably a little bit more um familiar and used to competing at uh you know that's the front end of India like Andretti were I mean, you know, sure, Alonso should have won yeah. that race. Uh, uh, we, we could have won that race, yeah, except it was Sato's day. So oh, now, yeah. now, Seth, you wanted to talk about another guy whose future is in the news a lot, that being Alexander Rossi. Yeah, exactly. Uh, at During the broadcast of the second race, uh, Marty Snyder uh, was talking about Alexander Rossi and also about Felix Rosenquist. And one of the conversations that came up he's, uh, that he had had with Chip Ganassi was, why don't you just write a check to get Alex to join your team? And Chip said, I just might this year. That kind of alludes to Chip being interested in trying to uh, woo Alexander Rossi away from Andretti and over to his team whether that would mean replacing Rosenquist or expanding back to three cars, I don't know. So, yeah, Rossi is an interesting guy. He's very much in demand. Um, I think – okay, I don't say I think. I know he's quite happy at Andretti, and I know he's got a great relationship with um, with his race engineer, Jeremy Millis. Um, they keep saying Roger is interested in getting Rossi there, but at the same time – you know, Roger doesn't want to take one of his guys off the table right there. Um, and and Roger's they used not to be a, a four-car team, though, didn't they? Yes, but Roger's not a fan of the four-car team. They expanded to the fourth car to accommodate uh, Pagano, to get Pagano on the team. And then they, they had some struggles that first year, so uh, it wasn't long before they scaled back down to three. Um, yeah, Roger's not a fan of the four-car model. Michael is a fan of the four-car model. Ganassi, Ganassi ran a four-car team for a while, and you know only two of those teams won races, and that's when uh, the other the guy in the ten car was Dario. Since Dario is retired, we haven't seen a solid guy in that ten car yet. Um, you know, Ed Jones struggled. Um, Canon won one race in the course of three years, and Rosenqvist has not been able to you know keep it off the wall. Not, not to say that Felix won't uh, come around because the guy's got a ton of talent. So, um, I, mean, I think this is you know, this is a developing story to see where Rossi's going to end up. But I, my gut feeling tells me at the end of the day that next year and possibly for the next three years after he signs a contract, he's going to be in the number twenty-seven Napa-sponsored Honda Andretti car. But you never know. We are off to Texas for Saturday night race. 
And Max Chilton from the from the um, Carlin team has announced uh, midweek that he will not be contesting Texas or any of the other ovals. Now his Gallagher sponsorship, which is the, the company that his father was a CEO of before he retired, uh, that is sponsored. The sponsor is staying on with the car. They are employing Connor Daly uh, for Texas. And we'll see who they put in the car at uh, Gateway and, and Iowa and Pocono. It could be Connor Daly for all those three. That's not uh, known yet. Um, the choice of Connor Daly, very popular. You know, young American driver, very popular. Folks love Connor Daly. But uh, uh, Max Chilton just bowing out on ovals. Um, Gray, you've been a little quiet. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on this? And then, Richard, you can be next. Yeah, do I? I think, too, you're looking at guys coming in. It's so few good rides in the IndyCar. And they get, they're bringing in guys that can can fill the bill as a specialist to some degree, you know, you know be it ovals or um, or uh, road courses. I think, you know, uh, probably Ed Carpenter Racing kind of set the standard for that, uh, you know, years ago with Ed concentrating solely on ovals and bringing in uh, road course guys to uh, – to, to uh, pilot these cars uh, on those venues, you know, we, uh, I think it's in some in some areas it's, it's good for the team. You, you know, it's it's uh, utilizing a strength that you don't have in certain areas. You know what I mean? I know what you mean. Yeah. So, uh, but so you you feel like maybe Chilton? Cause I, we talked about this on the pre-show that maybe Chilton is is not the guy they need on their oval program. Because we saw that the three cars bumped in Indianapolis were all Carlin cars. Uh, now, now Max, who led the most laps at Indy just two years ago um, when he drove for uh, for Chip, uh, really struggled at Indy. So now he stepped stepped away from the car. Um, Richard, he's he's cited risk management. Um, do you think that's that's what it comes down to, or do you believe there's a little more more to it than that? I mean, if it is risk management, I think, in all fairness, the people that would criticise them for that, I'd like to see them get in a car and do what these guys do on a daily basis anywhere. Never mind at a, um, uh, you know, a road course. I'm oh, sorry, at an oval like Texas. Um, I. It's difficult to say. I mean, ha- has he come in and, and, and been as successful uh, as he'd hoped? I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know what the expectation within the Carlin team is of him. I don't know what the expectation of him, you know, what level he puts himself at, you know, where he expects to be. Um, obviously, you know, the performance from Indy was disappointing for the whole fleet of cars that were prepared by Carlin. And, and I'm sure a lot of fingers were pointed and there's been a lot of soul searching done there. And, and maybe Max is like, hey, you know, if we're going to be running around 25th, or whatever, or 20th, or whatever, I'm not going to put my neck on the line for for that. You know, if they're running around in the top five or six, maybe it's a different answer. Um, but if they're, you know, if he's serious about IndyCar um, and, you know, wants to be a, you know, a championship contender, as, as, as Trevor Carling will want to be, he won't be there to make up numbers. Um, you need to be running a full season. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, I, 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 he's putting himself in a very, very difficult position because I think what will happen is if he does come back to oval racing and he does start to compete at you know places like Texas and Gateway and, 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 and these tracks, um, he'll be a, he'll be a target for the other drivers. You know, the other drivers will know they'll be able to bully him out the way and they'll be able to put pressure on him, and they expect that he'll react to that. So. I think it's, it's, he's putting himself in a very, very, very difficult position by doing this. And unless you're a Ed Carpenter who is a special, specialist oval racer, um, I, I, I see it working that way, but I really struggle to see how it works the way that Chil- Chilton's doing it. Yeah, well, I mean, there was a guy named Mike Conway who, yep. ste- who stepped away from ovals and – of course, Mike had some really bad wrecks. I mean, he had broken his back in two places at a really nasty wreck in Indianapolis. He had another uh, another wreck or two on oval tracks, and and so he said, "I just 
just don't want to do this, but I love road racing. And then, then of course, he fell into this uh, symbiotic relationship with Ed Carpenter where Ed says, I don't want to run the road courses, and Mike said, I don't want to run the ovals. And that season, they both won races. You know, yeah. you know Mike, Mike won at Long Beach and I think at Detroit, and I think, believe Ed, Ed won at Texas that year. So that worked really, really well. But I just don't see, you know, Chilton say, I, I want to become a road course specialist. Yeah. And or, or see, he didn't say that, though, did he? He, said he, that did, no, he, he didn't. Know. He didn't say that. He was very. That's the thing. His his comments were very. Oh, vague. Vague is the word for it. He said we cited yeah. risk management. Then he said, and I want to thank IndyCar for the safety things they're putting in. Now, Seth and I were talking earlier. Seth thought that maybe that should just wanted to bow out until the new head protection was in, um, which you know it's. It's a valid argument, you know. We, yeah. we, we've lost a couple guys in the in the last decade, um, and this this sort of thing would have saved them. So um, we'll just have to see what happens to Max from here and there. But it's certainly, um, it's not great. <laughs> you know, it's not. Uh, it, it, it doesn't look good, uh, especially when he refuses to elaborate anymore. So, but but if the man just says, "Hey, I have a tough time with the ovals," or he says. I've got a tough time trying to get the Carlin car to handle on the ovals, you know, where, yeah. where, where I did better driving with Chip Ganassi, and the team would benefit from a guy who's got more oval experience, and he's doing that as a team player. That would make sense, but Max has been pretty quiet. So, but, it, uh, I mean, In reality, as I say, it's very easy for us to say here, but, I mean, ovals must be scary as it is, but if those things aren't handling, gee, you must be... Uh, you know, puckering at times. Oh, exactly. Yeah, you can't you can't take anything away from the man. Yeah, you can't. People people want to say he, you know, he wimped out or wussed out or he's afraid. But hey, man, look, this is yeah. um, you know, this is life or death. Exactly. This is life or death. So, with that being said, we've only got a few minutes left in the show. So let's make some picks for IndyCar at Texas, and then we need to make some picks for Formula One in Canada. So, Richard. I'll give you the okay. first pick. You can pick your Formula One guy and your IndyCar guy in whichever order you'd like. Formula One guy has to be Hamilton, doesn't it, really? I, I guess. Um, IndyCar guy. Ooh, where are we? Texas, aren't we? Um, Pagano. Okay. He's gonna pick, it, pick it back up again. He's going to pick get it back, back up there. again. Yep. Good for you. Uh, excuse me. Gray? Oh. Let's see. For uh, Texas, I'm going to go with Rossi. I think he'll. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go with Great. Rossi. And uh, for, um, I mean, who 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 do you, how are you going to go against uh, Hamilton at uh, at Canada? All right. So Seth. Well. Just to be different uh, for Formula One compared to uh, Gray and uh, Richard, I'm going to go with Botas uh, in Canada. Um, f- since Gray took my IndyCar pick, uh, I'll go with New Garden in Texas. All right, good pick. So I'm going to go for the Formula One race. I'm going to say that Vettel wins uh, because, you know, f- you know, Mercedes has been in the news saying uh, they we're not too sure about our next update. Ferrari could win a race, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take them up on that bet. Uh, only to see hmm. only to see Hamilton win <laughs> at the end of the day. Uh, but for Texas, I'm gonna go with Will Power, who's uh, hmm. had a nice rebound in um, in Detroit race two, and uh, he's a guy who's actually one of the best oval racers in the in the series right now despite having a career to start out as a road course specialist. So, we're out of time. Heard from Max Chilton yet, isn't there? I haven't heard from Max, no. So. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you, Richard, for being uh, sarcastic as always. I want to thank you, uh, Seth. I want to thank you, Gray. I want to thank the Hoobazoo Radio Network. I want to thank iHeartRadio and Spreaker. And I want to thank all you folks that tune in and listen to us week in and week out. Have a great week. Good night. W-H-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-S-U-B-Z-O-C-O-M. W-H-O-O-B-A-Z-O-O-S-U-B-Z-O-C-O-M. Enter your website. Enter your website. Enter your website.